All right, Romans 12. Paul is, in my opinion, officially going back into an application mode for his letter. He's writing this letter to the Christians in Rome, Jewish and Gentile Christians, and he's trying to communicate to them the simple truth that's found way back in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all, how many? All who believe, for the Jew first and for the Gentile. And he spent the whole letter just looking at that from every possible angle, and now He's getting back. He started an application mode in chapters 7 and 8 and got a little sidetracked on his love for the Jews and God's plan for them in chapters 9, 10, and 11. And now in 12, he's taken it back to what does this mean for us? What does this look like for us? How do we do this? It has some application. And I intended to do the whole chapter today. That's not going to (laughs) happen. I got into studying, and I thought, no, this is, this is just too rich. And I was, as I was looking at the chapter as a whole, because, you, you know, you know these chapter divisions weren't put in until years and years and years and years later. So they're, they're artificial, but they're useful, obviously, in a way so that we can find stuff. But the truth is, as I was studying this, chapters 1 and 2 are really a great transition into the rest of the letter, because, I mean, I I don't know about you, I'm used to hearing verses one and two by themselves. Great truth in and of themselves, and I didn't want to do just these two verses by themselves because I wanted to show how they really feed into what's coming up next. The only problem is there's too much there to, to skip. So we are going to do just verses one and two today, but that will help us lay the foundation for next week when we see, okay, now that we've talked about it, we know what we're talking about, let's see how that then leads into what's coming up next, but there are these really amazing transitional verses into the gifts of the Spirit, and what it means to be the body, and what it means to live all of this out. And these two verses begin what is primarily not an emotional appeal, but a rational appeal. Now, that's not exclusively rational, but it begins with your mind. It does begin with how you think, which emotions and actions then, of course, follow. So it's not exclusively rational, but that's, that's really where it begins. So let's, uh, and I really want, I want to call these two chunks, it was going to be one chunk, now it's two. Uh, I wanted to summarize them with the phrase living together. And both of those words are important. It is about living. It's not just a thinking thing. It's not just a mental thing. It's not just a set of rules thing, a philosophy thing. It is a living out thing. It is an alive thing. It is a thing that we all go through, which means together. We need to live this out together. It is living with God. It is also living with one another. And, you know, as much as I obviously love the internet and technology, it has done its fair share of dividing us, of causing us not to need to live together. I mean, it used to be you'd have to go to the store and buy stuff. Well, now you can just go online, click, 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 type, 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 and it shows up at your house within 24 hours. You didn't have to talk to one human being. And some of us say, thank Goodness, I'd have to talk somewhere. Um, but you, we don't have to anymore. So I really want to emphasize that at the beginning that this is about living together. But we need to see this transition that Paul wants to take us through so that we are thinking about it the right way as we go in. So let's read verses 1 and 2 of Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be trans, excuse me, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All right, let's, let's go back and, and um, chew on some of this. I want to actually focus on the word therefore first. He says, I beseech you therefore, but I want to say, I want to switch it and put the therefore first because we have to set the context of this. And what's the context? What he just said in chapter 11. So let's go back uh, a few verses before this to verse 30 of chapter 11. Paul says, for as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so, these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. And what he's trying to do in those two verses is tie together the 
election predestination aspect of God's work through Israel and then through the Gentiles with the free will aspect of obedience and faith. He's bringing in these two things that he spent these two chapters, 9 and 11, or excuse me, 9 and 10, and then putting them together in 11. He's trying to bring all that stuff together. Disobedience from them means faith for you, and as you have more become to faith, then they see it and want to become saved, and it's this big cycle. And then he sort of loses it in verse 33. Oh, the depth and riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of, of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who, or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all these things to whom be glory forever. Amen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There is a flow there. There is a connection there between what he just said, what he is saying, of course, and what he is about to say about being the body, about living together. So that's the context, this plan that God has and how he has worked, how he is working. And then when you, just when you seem to think you can or can't get your mind wrapped around, he says, you know what? No one, no one knows the mind of God. No one can completely know the mind of God or else they would be bigger than God. So he's not just saying, just, you know, shut up and don't worry about it and just kind of go with the flow. He's just saying, we should all be in awe of God. We should all be at this point like he is. He's just having this, praise moment of, God, I don't get it. I don't get you. I don't, I can't understand how you work, but I know that you're awesome, and I know that you love me. I know that you like me. I know that you, that you have a plan for me, and ultimately, of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. So he says, because of that, I beseech you, and this word for beseech, it's like, how are we going to take all, like, 45 minutes talking about two verses? Trust me, we can do it. Because there's some heavy-duty word study stuff that you really need to get a grip on to see where this is going to go. He says, I beseech you. This is Paul's heart for the Romans. This is Paul's heart for the reader. I beseech you. It means it's very close to the word for the Holy Spirit, for counselor. It means one who comes alongside. But it means, I beseech you, I come alongside of you to encourage you, to push you, to exhort you, to lovingly, as lovingly as I can, just say, come on, let's go. It's, it's as if to modernize it, he would say, dudes, seriously. That's what he's saying. Dudes, for real now, okay? That's kind of the gist of I beseech you. It's very, we don't, how often do you use the word beseech? Honey, I beseech you, please. <laughs> what? No. <laughs> Whatever it is, no. Because I don't like, no. Um, but that's what he's trying to say. This is his heart. He's coming alongside and saying, dude, seriously, let's go. This is, this is important. I want to push you in a direction that's important. I beseech you, brethren. This is you, plural. He's writing to Romans. This is, this is you. This is all y'all. And, and if you have an old King James, it's ye, which means y'all. Right? We don't have a, that's the only modern really plural we have. We've talked about before. If you lived around Pittsburgh, they have a word that says yuns. Y apostrophe U-N-S, yuns. <laughs> First time I heard that, I'm like, are you okay? Yuns? No, it's, it's, it's the same thing. This is you. This is for all of you. And it will become important later because he is talking to you. He is talking to us about being the body collectively. You. I beseech you. Dude, seriously, you. By the mercies of God. This word for mercies, there are, as you may know, different words in Greek that sometimes we translate to into the same word in English. This is one of those times, like the word for love, there's different Greek words for love, there are different Greek words for mercy. The one that's most commonly used means as if you it means mercy that has an action with it. Like if I were to say, have mercy on me, it means there's some kind of action I want you to perform. You know, I throw myself up on the mercy of the court. You know, have God have mercy on me. Or, or there, there's a connection, and God has expressed his mercy, obviously, through Jesus Christ. This word has the same bent, but there's no action connected to it. Its emphasis is more on the feeling. This word for mercy really has to do with this deep-down compassion 
that it suffers because of the suffering of, the, of another. That's what this mercy means. It, it suffers because of the mercy of another. So he's, he's using this word, think about that, by the mercies of God. God feels, has compassion, and in effect suffers because of the sufferings of others, namely of us. Think about that. God feels for us, whether it be because of our practical circumstances, God cares about those things, and then, of course, the big picture of, of Jesus. That is the ultimate expression. If you want to go take it back to that mercy that does something, he did something through Jesus. But there's this interesting contrast between Paul's heart, I beseech you, by the mercies of God, God's heart for us. I think that's cool how he brings both of those things into it. God feels for you. Doesn't anybody care? Yes. God cares. God is, feels it for you. When Jesus Christ walked this earth and saw that people were suffering and hurting, he felt it. It wasn't like, hey, was you need healing? Bam. Okay, you're done. You need healing? Bam. Okay. There was, it wasn't just this kind of this casual, you know, shotgun, heal, you know, taking care of people's problems. It was, or Nerf guns, right, Kevin? I got some of that. <laughs> it wasn't just that. It was rapid fire. Get, 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 get your heel. I love you. It was, it was, he felt. He saw the suffering. He felt the compassion. He, he knew, which is why Jesus came to earth in the first place, so that he could identify with our sufferings, so that he could say, I know what you went through. Ever felt abandoned? Jesus on the cross. Abandonment. Everybody split. Everybody left him. He knows how we feel. Ever felt hungry? Like hungry? Fasted for 40 days? He knows the hunger. He knows he experienced it all. So he can have this kind of mercy. So he says, by the mercies of God, by God's feeling this with you, by his compassion feeling this with you, here's what I want you to do. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. He says, present, right? This word for, you could actually kind of make it a, a play on words in English. You, you present a present. If you just twist it, right? Because well, what do you do with the present? You have the present and you say, here, you set it by, you set it next to, you give it to them personally, but you are presenting something. Anybody ever have a cat that caught a mouse and presented it to you? Yuck. But that's what it's doing, right? It's, look what I found. And he puts it down and he's like, stupid cat. What's wrong with you? It's gross. And then they bat it around and play with it. But that's the idea is you bring it before and you set it there. I present you this present. So Paul is telling us to present. Present what? Yourselves. Hmm. Okay. Present. But he says present your bodies. And this bodies is just that. Body. All of it. <laughs> Belly. Hair that's not as much as it was yesterday. Weak, strong, fat, thin, tall, short, whatever. Present your body. It is just that simple. This is your body. Present it to God. Say, God, here. Good luck. <laughs> Use it however you need Go for it. Knock yourself out. Present your body a living, living. Well, what's living? Living, again, it's, it seems obvious, but it is just that. To be alive, to be animate, to, it's the opposite of dead, right? You don't present a dead thing. You present a living sacrifice. Here I am. I'm alive. My body is functioning, however, whatever level your body functions at. And you say, here, present your body a living sacrifice, and I don't, again, I don't know about you, I read that and I go, what? Because sacrifices are usually, well, it's something that is dead or is about to be dead. Like you think of a sacrifice, it's something you're going to give over. Here's, here, whether it be the, in the Levitical system or whether it be whatever the, the various pagan heathen systems they had for all of the, the Roman and Greek gods and all and dozens of those and incense offerings and meat offerings and money offerings and all, all these other kinds of offerings and sacrifices, but... He is telling us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. A sacrifice is a thing that is given over 
as an offering, and it's given completely, right? You didn't go to the temple and go, okay, well, here's the lamb, but I want to shave it first and keep, keep the wool. Or you know, here's, here's my uh, whatever. The, they could offer grain and, and wine and different. They didn't say, well, here's some, but I'm going to keep some of this back. It was complete. It was a complete giving. It was given over completely and in many cases, voluntarily. Let's just talk for a second about why our sacrifice is given. And, uh, you know, to, to take a step back and make it a big picture thing, sacrifices are given to somehow deal with your relationship with a God. And this is why I say big picture, because, as I said, they gave sacrifices to false gods and so forth, and so it's, it's a common, commonly understood concept. You gave a sacrifice because of your connection to your God, your relationship with your God. So some reasons why sacrifices are given. Sometimes they were a requirement. It was an obedience thing. In fact, um, in the Roman Empire, you had to once a year go to a designated place and offer a pinch of incense onto a fire as your offering to Caesar because they viewed whoever was Caesar as a god. And this was a problem for Christians because they're not supposed to worship or sacrifice to false gods. And so this was a test. They could either just simply take the little bit of incense and put it on the fire. That was it. That's all they had to do. Or not. But to do so is to put another god before their true god. So that, that was a problem. But again, just in a, in a general sense, sometimes it was, it was a requirement thing, which meant it was an obedience thing. And I don't know that this is the, this is the case here. This isn't a requirement offering. Sometimes sacrifices were given to make atonement or an appeasement to the God. The gods are angry, so I must give them something. I must appease their anger. That's, we haven't had rain, or we've had too much rain, or we, it's, my crops are bad, or the animals are dying, or something's wrong, so I have to give something to make the gods happy so that they will fix my problem, an appeasement of the gods. Uh, you know, sort of a, a set it, give it, and, and forget about it, and then you go on as normal until the next crisis turns up. Some people view God that way. God, something's wrong in my life, and I promise if you fix it, I will do this. And then God fixes it. And then you do whatever the thing may be that you said you would do. And then you kind of say, okay, I'm done with that crisis. I'm going to go about my normal way. God's up there, and I'm down here until the next thing happens. And then the next thing happens, and you say, God, if you fix this, I will whatever. And you have this appeasement connection to God. That is not our God. God doesn't want appeasement from us. So I don't think that's the case here. I think what Paul is talking about is a voluntary gift. And a gift that is given, a sacrifice that is given without expectation of a return. Why? Because God has already done. God has already done the giving for us. This is you could call it a love offering. In the Levitical system, there were offerings that you could give just simply out of thanksgiving. You, you love God and you want to just give him something. It was a, a voluntary offering that you could give him. I think that's, that might be what Paul has in mind here. But in this case, what's the offering? Your bodies as living sacrifices. This, I don't know about you, but it brings to my mind back when we were in Romans 6. Paul talked about this sort of idea. Back in 6.3, he said, Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Isn't that a sacrifice? You give something and it is killed and it is sacrificed, it's given. You were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were baptized with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Jesus said, take up your cross, right? Take up your cross daily and follow me. It means to die to yourself regularly. You are a living sacrifice, which again, it sounds like an oxymoron, but you are a living sacrifice sacrifice. You have given your body, which means you have given your life, so long as your body can inhale and exhale, over to God and said, here, use me as you will. Does, it, does God owe you anything? 
even if he does use you? No, doesn't, because he's already given. But that's not to say he won't bless you. That's not to say God doesn't want to bless, because he clearly does, and that's, that's a different topic. But what I really want to drive home here, and what I think Paul is trying to communicate, is that as a living sacrifice, it means that we give everything we have, it means if we give everything we are. It means if we give everything that we think. It means that we are completely given over to God. Completely. Everything we think, every reaction we have, every expectation we have, every dollar that we have, every breath that we have is given over to God because we are his living sacrifices. I really think that's what he has in mind. In, in light of God's awesomeness, in light of his sovereignty, in light of the fact that he gives us the opportunity to express faith and obedience, the natural consequence is give yourself as a living sacrifice. Why? Because of his mercies. Because of his feeling for you, with you. Because he can identify with how you feel. That's why we should do this. Because Jesus is the sacrifice, isn't he? The ultimate sacrifice, given as an example, given for us. Now, I realized as I was sort of studying this and writing this out, I'm like, you know what? Christianity sounds like a real drag. Like, if you take just this by itself, it's like, I don't want that. That's lame. That's dumb. And, you know, if, if that's all that it was, it would be pretty lame. It would be pretty, like, <laughs> Okay, God, but you wanted to beat me up some more. I'm going to go do this stuff. Uh, so there really is a whole bigger picture to this, but sometimes it's, folk, it's good to focus on certain parts of it. I mean, read the book of the letter of Philippians, which is all about joy, right? I rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, and he talks about why we need to rejoice in spite of circumstances. Uh, there's, there's this tremendous love that God has for us and this peace that we can have that Jordan shared about earlier, the verses I put out in the email about the peace of God will, sur that surpasses all understanding. Well, you'll have that, and there's, there's so much more to this. But what Paul is trying to do is get these people to rethink what they are and who they are in life, in general. That's that's what he's trying to do. And I think we need to do the same thing. We need to stop once in a while and go, okay, wait. Who am I living for? Who am, who am I sacrificing for? Who, whose am I? Who do I belong to? And Paul is telling them to present, to say, hear God, ourselves as living sacrifices. And then he gives a couple of sort of adjective words. Holy and acceptable Holy means perfect and without blemish, right? Set apart, holy. Uh, acceptable means well-pleasing. This is acceptable to me. It's not just like, yes, this passes, you know, stamp of approval. This is, this is, what, this is good. This makes me happy. This is well-pleasing to me. And so you read that and you go, wait, how can I present myself as a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable? Because I know me and I'm not holy. Okay, and I, I barely think of myself as, as acceptable, but the reality is we're in Christ, right? If you are in Christ, you are holy. You are acceptable to God if you're in him. You ever think about yourself, man, I have to, how can God see me as, as holy? How can God accept me as I am? Well, he doesn't accept you as you are. He accepts you as you are in Christ. This is the difference between positional theology and practical theology. Positionally, if you're in Christ, when God looks at you, he sees you in him, which means he sees you filtered through Jesus' righteousness, through Jesus' sacrifice, through Jesus' blood. But he sees you, but he sees you in Christ. That's positionally. Practically, we'll, we're still here. We're still going through this. We are still actually, we are going through the process of being made holy. We are through going through the process of being made acceptable but again, when God sees us, he already sees us as holy. He already sees us as acceptable. So you are acceptable to God. You are holy to God. Does that mean we need to stop trying to be holy? Depends on why you're trying. <laughs> if you're trying to be holy so that God will say, look at me, God, I'm being holy. No, that's, that's not why we should try. We should tr we should. Pursue holiness. We are actually commanded to pursue holiness. Peter quotes the Old Testament. God saying, be holy for I am holy. Uh, what? 
<laughs> you're telling me to be holy as you are holy? He says, uh-huh. How can I do that? Jesus, through Christ, we do that. So we don't try to be holy to earn God's approval. We should try to be holy for the same reason we should do what we do in our lives to set ourselves apart for a spouse, for example. You are holy to your spouse by not giving yourself to other people, right? The Bible calls idolatry spiritual adultery. When you worship another god, when you worship yourself and you worship a thing, you are cheating on God. You are an unho- That is an unholy practice, but to be holy is to be set apart and you want, hopefully, to do things for your spouse, for the one you love, that expresses that holiness, that expresses that love, because it's motivated by love. So positionally, we're holy because we're in Him. Practically, we should pursue holiness because we love God. We should want to set ourselves apart from the world to God to then be sent back into the world to be used by Him, to be in the world and not of it. But this, we, can, we can present our bodies as living sacrifices that are holy, that are acceptable to God because we are in Christ. That's, that's what he's talking about. Now, where does this all go? Why do we do this? Because, he says at the end of the verse, it is our reasonable service. <laughs> Again, you, just, you read that like for the first time maybe or the 20th time and you go, what? Your reasonable service. What does that mean? And here's my best understanding of this. The word for reasonable, it means that it is done with reason. Duh, that you love those kind of definitions. Gullible, see gullible. Wait, wait, what? Um, It's something that this word for reasonable means, it means your reason, it means your intellect, it means uh, you're thoughtful, it means that you're, that it's done knowing what you are doing, or you could say it's done deliberately having thought it through, as opposed to, sometimes it's good, helpful to use what it's not. It's, this, is, this would not be something that's done from blind or thoughtless obedience. This is not just doing it because you were told to do it. This is doing it because you have thought it through, because it is a reasonable thing, because you are going to do it deliberately, and not an emotional or carnal response as many of the, the pagan practices of the day um, This is a rational, a reasonable thing to do in light of what God has done. This is what God's done for me. What do I want to do for him? Instead of just reacting emotionally or instead of being handed a checklist for holiness and just, oh, I'm going to go through my list. You have thought this through. This this is what makes sense. This is reasonable. And it is your reasonable service. What does service mean? This word for service means a, it's a religious kind of service. And that's not, you know, just in a biblical sense, but again, because of the, he's using words that they would have understand, but going to the temples, going to worship all the other gods, you go to the priest who performs a service. He performs a sacrifice, he gives an offering, he gives an incantation, he offers a blessing. That's a service. It is a religious act. It is a, an activity that is a, like a performance of worship, an act of worship. That's what this word service means. It's an act of worship. And again, it's in response. Why would you want to have perform an act of worship at this point? Because it's a response to the awesomeness of God expressed back in verse 36 of chapter 11. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. That should make a person want to worship God. Wow, right? Sometimes that's the best way to worship is just to go, wow, wow. Some, there's a, a song by a guy named Jason Gray. Is the, some of the most commonly used prayers he used are, help me and thank you. Sometimes prayer doesn't have to be that much more complicated. Worship doesn't have to be much more complicated than going, wow, God, you're awesome. God, you're, you are, right? That's where this comes from. It's a want to, not a have to. That's what this service means. So, Paul says, dudes, seriously, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, by God's compassion for you, by God's deep inner feeling for you in your situation, that you present, that you give your bodies a living sacrifice, 
something that's given over voluntarily, something that's given over completely without any expectation in return, that it, it is a holy thing. It is a thing that is acceptable to God, which is your reasonable, logical, thought-through, deliberately done act of worship. That's what he's talking about. That's, what, and that's sort of the, the core of what he's talking about. And now he's going to expand on it a little bit more in verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do not be conformed. This is a command. This is an, this is an imperative statement. This is, it's not just, hey, you know, no, don't do that. This is, dude, don't. Seriously. For real, right? Do not do this. Do not be conformed. To be conformed means to, to be fashioned after the same pattern, outwardly. It means, and we, maybe we've talked about this before too, you take, you, you ever taken silly putty and taken like a quarter and you jam the quarter into the silly putty and then you peel it out? What do you have? A picture of the quarter, right? That silly putty has been conformed to the image of the quarter, that's what this word means. Do not be conformed. Don't let the world impress upon you its image so that when you are looked upon, that's what they see. Don't be smushed into the world's shape. Don't be conformed to this world. The world is out to conform people. The world is this big stamp that wants to make everybody else into its image, and it's always changing, too. That, that's sort of the, the funny thing about it. But he said, Paul says, don't do that. Don't give yourself over to allowing that to happen in your life. Don't be conformed to this world. Instead, in contrast to being conformed, be transformed. And this word is also a command. It's also an imperative. This is a command. What are God's commands? Well, here's two of them. Don't be conformed to the world and be transformed be transformed instead. To be transformed, it's metamorphosis. It's, it's the elementary school project where you go find the caterpillar that's spun the cocoon and you put it in the glass case and it sits on the teacher's desk and you watch it for however long it takes and it's turned into goo inside and getting all smushy and changing color and then one day, pops open, right? It was a caterpillar, now it's a butterfly. That's a metamorphosis. That's a transformation. It's a change from one form into another. Don't be conformed, shaped on the outside. Be transformed. There is an inside-out change that is supposed to happen, and you could say this is an exchanged life. Your life needs to be exchanged. Your life is supposed to be transformed from the form it was in at the beginning into a new form, into something that is qualitatively different from what it was before. It's a new thing. Brand new deal. Goes in a caterpillar, comes out a butterfly. Same kind of deal. Well, how? How do you do that? By the renewing of your mind. Okay, renewing. He's using these words very specifically, very deliberately. Renewing means a renovation. It means a complete change. It's not like you go buy a house and you flip it by throwing on some paint and some new pillows and some new furniture. No, it's, like, it's a renew. It's a renovation. It's a strip it down to nothing and renovate the thing, rebuild the thing. It's a renewal. It's a, it's a tr again, it's another way of, of transformation. This is where the transformation begins. This is where the inside out begins, the renewing of your mind. And this word for mind means your thinking, your, even your feeling, your reason, your conscience. It's, it's the opposite of your fleshly appetites. It's the opposite of the, the side of you that just, that's, you know, when you're too hopped up on sugar and you just want to go, go, and just... It's not, that, it's not that crazy side of you. This is, this is the rational side of you. If, you know, if someone were to say, have you lost your mind? Or he's not in his right mind. That would be, that's kind of what we're talking about. It's, well, that's the opposite of what we're talking about. It's, it's to be out of your mind means you're just completely emotional, completely not thinking, you're just reacting, you're just going. This is not that. This is the part of you that is in control. This is the part of you that is thinking. This is the part of you that is rational. This is the part of you that is reasonable. Like in verse 1, this is where this thread of reason is taking place. 
Um, you could even say it goes back to verse 34. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? Paul says, have your mind renewed to conform to God's mind. You could, you could even put it that way. Or another way to translate this verse entirely, or this, the first half of this verse, would be this. Stop being molded by the external and fleeting fashions of this age. I'll read that, just that first part again. Stop being molded by the external and fleeting fashions of this age, but undergo a deep inner change by the qualitative renewing of your mind. What did I just say? Well, I just said what he said over here. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I thought I had the whole verse up on the screen. Maybe it'll, it'll pop up in a second, but that, that other translation, the other way of thinking about that. Don't be molded by the external and fleeting fashions of this world. Undergo a deep interchange by the qualitative renewing of your mind. That's building upon what we just talked about, right? Well, where does that go? Well, he says that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, what does it mean to prove? I mean, you know, somebody's, somebody makes some outlandish statement. What do you say? Prove it. Like, demonstrate the truth of the thing. That's kind of what this means, but it's not like nearly a challenge. To prove something means, it. well, I think we've actually used this before. You've seen the commercial, I think it's, what is it, Kicks? Kid tested, mother approved, Right? The kid eats the cereal, he likes it. The mom goes, well, it looks okay to me, but it's really just mostly sugar anyway. Doesn't, you can't get around that. But the mother approves it because it's gone through a process. That's kind of the idea. It's, it has passed the test. It has gone through uh, a proving period where it's, it's been under pressure or it's whatever the material, they have materials that they build and they put them under different pressures to see if it's going to hold up. They do that with steel for bridges. They, they have the different formulas for how strong it's supposed to be. They mix it all up, make the shape, and then they test it to see if it's going to hold up to the pressures that it's supposed to hold up to. It is being proved, and it has passed the test. So he says, go through this process so that you may prove. It's a process thing. It's not just a one-time prove it and we're done. It's, it's an ongoing testing. It's an ongoing demonstration, okay? Okay. Prove what? Demonstrate what? What is that good and acceptable? Good means good. That was simple, right? <laughs> something that is good. Acceptable, we already talked about that. Something that is well-pleasing. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Perfect. New word. It means complete. Something that is perfect, it means that there is, you don't need anything else to make it the way you want it. There's nothing missing, nor is there anything extra. Something that is perfect, something that is complete, means that there's nothing lacking, but there's also nothing extra. It's just right. It's the three bears. Like, this one's too hot. This one's too cold. This one's just right. That's perfect. There's nothing missing. There's nothing extra. It is complete. That's what, it, that's what this word means. It means that it's at the end of whatever it has taken to get it to be what it is. Like, you watch those shows, how it's made. Well, it goes through different steps and different processes, and once they're done, do they keep adding to it? No. Like, you're making a hammer, and now we're going, now we're going to attach a car door. It's, well, <laughs> it's not a hammer anymore. <laughs> what have you done to this thing? You, once you have the hammer, you are done making the tool, and you stop working on it. That's how it should be. Otherwise, you no longer have a hammer. Um, it's perfect. It's complete. Well, what's perfect and complete? The will of God. This word for will refers to the thing that you want to see happen or the purpose of a thing. The will of God means this is what God wants to see happen. This is what God's purpose is. Now, one of the negative things of doing a word study like this, when you try to get really fine and granular, is you can lose focus on the big picture. So let me see if I can tie this all back into a big picture what is he talking about in these two verses? Here's what I have. <laughs> He's talking about the process of being transformed by the renewing of our minds, of being living sacrifices 
that we voluntarily present as our reasonable service. And all of this is the testing process, the proving process, which is the complete will of God. He was lost as I am. <laughs> See, I wrote that, and it's still like, what? Uh, are, are we still talking about the same thing? Let me see if we can um, get that up on the screen here in a couple of clicks, because I got behind in my stuff. There we go. This process, he's talking, about it, he's talking about a process that we go through. It's the process of being transformed by the renewing of our minds, of being living sacrifices that we voluntarily present as our reasonable service, and all of this is the testing process. It's the proving process, and it is that process that is the complete will of God. It's not so much the end as it is the process. Like we said, we are, being, we are holy in him, but we are being made holy. We are acceptable to him, but we are being made acceptable. When we were studying Second Peter, it always talked about salvation as though it's some future thing. Well, aren't I saved now? Yes, but you are being saved. These two verses are talking about a process thing that all begins with us presenting ourselves as living sacrifices. You might ask, what is God's will for my life? To be a living sacrifice. That's one answer, to be going through being transformed from the inside out by the renewing of your mind, which is done by the Holy Spirit and the experiences we go through. We tend to go through experiences and assume that God is somewhere out there separate from us. And then we stop and we say, God, what are you doing? Why am I going through this? When the reality is, is that he's right here next to us. He is right there with us as we go through this, and in some cases, steering this process so that we can be transformed by the renewing of our minds, so that we can stop and ask, God, why are you doing this? And he will tell you maybe the next day, maybe a year later, he will say, that's why you went through that. And you go, oh, okay. So that whatever, maybe you can show somebody else. Maybe you can walk through it with somebody else. Maybe it's preparing you to take an even bigger step. And he's building a foundation of faith. All kinds of reasons why that may be the case. But the process is the will of God. As you go through it, you are proving, you are demonstrating that this is God's will. That this is what he wants. That you are his living sacrifice. See, the key to having a transformed life and in fact, one of the major points of the Christian life is changing the way we think, changing the way I think, changing the way you think about everything. And when you change the way you think, hopefully, you will change the way, it will change the way that you act. Like I said at the beginning, being a Christian is not simply to adopt a new morality, it's not simply to adopt a new code, it's not simply to want to be this way and not another way because you can choose from a buffet of ways you want to be. It is all about having a new mind. It's all about having a new thinking. Now, there are those who would hear such a statement and say, you Christians are just about brainwashing. You want to tell people what to think. You want to tell people how to think. You don't want people to think for themselves or to make any decisions for themselves. Or you just want them to, to regurgitate this stuff that they hear at church. They will accuse people like me or believers of brainwashing. You're just brainwashing people. You're not teaching people how to think. You're not teaching people how to reason. You're just telling them what to think. And ironically, the people who say that have been brainwashed into saying that. They have been told that by someone else. They've actually never looked at it for themselves. They've just been told that. And so what are they doing? Just regurgitating it out onto us. I spent two years in public education at the college level, University of Washington, a year in community school. I know for a fact from personal experience that they do, they do not teach you how to think. They teach you what to think. You are educated in a way of thinking, and it is the right way, and all of the ways are wrong ways. But I thought we valued diversity. I thought everything, everybody, no, <laughs> we don't. It's, it's, it's a... It's a veil. It's fake. It's, it's not reality. Um, they absolutely teach you, and it is as much brainwashing 
as anything. And in fact, you have to be careful in a way, this could sound like I'm just contradicting myself, but hear me out. When someone comes up and says, you need to think for yourself, you need to decide what's right and wrong, that is exactly what that little snake back in the garden said to Eve. You will not surely die, but you will become like God, knowing what is good and evil. Meaning, you, you will get to decide for yourself what is good and evil. That's what knowing means. You, you, will, you will be able to know for yourself. You will be able to discern, decide, determine for yourself what is good and evil. It's the same deception. Because what? think about it. I, I will try not to go too far with this. What happens if each of us individually decides for ourselves what is good and evil? Chaos. I come up, I punch you in the face. You say, hey, that's wrong. Not for me. Because I decide what's right and wrong for me. You might have a different decision. That's, that's your business. That's mine. I come up and I shoot you. Hey, that's, I'm dead. I can't respond to that. No. <laughs> Somebody else says, that's wrong. You can't do that. Well, that's your morality. I can decide for myself. And you're supposed to actually value what I believe because we value diversity. We value tolerance. Right? If we all, everyone just decided for ourselves what was right and what was wrong, utter chaos, complete chaos, and no one could say otherwise. There would be no basis for a system of law, little basis for a system of government. What is needed? An outside source to decide what is good and wrong. I happen to have one for you. His name is God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Not you, not L. Ron Hubbard, not Ray Bradbury, not any of other, nobody. God did. He gets to decide what is right and wrong. And guess what? He loves you. Despite the fact that you have rejected him. God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He was the sacrifice. He is the ultimate expression of love. And it is because of his example that Paul tells us to present your bodies as living sacrifices. How do we do this? Number one, by following Jesus', Jesus I can't say that, Jesus' example. Go to Philippians 2. Jesus presented himself as a living sacrifice. God, I should say, uh, either way, Jesus never asks us to do anything he hasn't already done himself. Philippians 2. I can't find it. There it is. Starting in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Hmm, there's that word mind again. Coincidence? I think not. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. There's that form word again. And coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of a cross, sacrifice. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on the earth, of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. He did it. He came to be the living sacrifice, to demonstrate what it means to be the living sacrifice. Well, good job, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for that example. I will do my best to follow it. What do I need to do to follow that? Well, I believe the answer to that is found in discipleship. Jesus said, go and make disciples. What's a disciple? A disciple is a student. A disciple is someone who follows his teacher so closely as they walk down the road that he is covered in the dust that his teacher kicks up. As they walk down this dirty, dusty path of life, he's so close that he's caked in the dust of his master. Back in the day, discipleship was you ate, you slept, you said, you heard everything that the, your master did. The person you were trying to emulate, the person you were trying to learn from, you did everything they did so that when they died, guess what? You get to step up and be what they were. That is, in effect, 
what we are with Jesus. We are his disciples. We should be following him so closely that we are covered in his dust. We should be able to know what he has said. We should be able to say what he has said. We should be able to do, in many respects, what it is he did. Which, and this might sound extreme, but it's true. And I think I can back it up with Scripture, absolutely. I believe that the church, that the process of discipleship needs to be the center. It needs to be the hub of our lives. You just want people to come to church, and you just want people to give to church, and you just want people to... No, I don't. Zip it. <laughs> That's not what I want. The church, the body of Christ, living together and being discipled and consequently discipling others, that should be the hub of the believer's life. That should be the center. Everything should revolve around that. And I'm not asking you to, to say it's one or the other. When you're saying I can't do anything else, I'm not, no, I'm not saying one. Can my kids not play sports? No, I'm not saying they can't play sports. Can I not be in the bowling league? No, I'm not saying you can't be in the bowling league. No, I'm not saying it's one or the other. I am saying that discipleship comes first and everything else comes after that. If you have to, cons I'm, I, you're being all legalistic. I'm not trying to make a set of rules and there are reasons and permutations and possibilities for this process. But what I am saying, if you have to consistently choose between doing some other thing and actively being discipled, and you're choosing the other thing, that you're making the wrong choice. Jesus wants to use people to change the world, and he has chosen to do that through the church. We are his body. We are his hands. We are his feet. It all comes back to this. And I just want to read another verse or two just so you can see where this is going. And I'm almost done, I promise. He goes on to say, For I say, through the grace given to me, this is uh, Romans 12, 3, to everyone who is among you, not to think, here's that reason word again, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, we have lots of different body parts, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Imagine if your body parts were divided from your body and off doing their own thing regularly. That's weird. I know. But that's what the church has become. Arms are off doing their own thing. Fingers are off doing their own thing. Legs and feet and spleens and livers are too often choosing to do other things than being connected to the body where there is life where there is growth, where the arm needs the liver, the fingers need the spleen, and the spleen needs the fingers to put food into the body that the stomach can digest and send fuel and food everywhere. It's all together. Paul uses this picture on purpose. And if we are choosing to be detached on a regular basis and off doing our own things, and I'm not saying those things are inherently wrong or evil, not saying that, I'm just saying if they come first, there is a priority problem. All of this is connected. All of this is integrated. All of this is important. How can I obey these commands to be transformed, to not be conformed, to present my body as a living sacrifice? How can you do that? Well, primarily that strength comes from the Holy Spirit. It comes from God shining his light in us and through us and showing us, oh, I'm making the wrong choices. I'm doing the wrong stuff. It's not wrong. I'm, I'm putting it ahead of my God and you shall have no other gods before me and that's a problem and I need to fix that. And then the strength to make the right choices also comes through the Holy Spirit. Is it going to be easy? No. Negatory. Mm -mm. It is not easy, which is why you require the strength of God <laughs> to do it, which is why you need the God who said, let there be light to do that in you and through you. It all happens through discipleship, being given over, being that student. That's how this is accomplished. That's how it begins. And again, this goes somewhere, and we could spend another hour talking about the rest of the chapter, but I don't want to do that today. I've got to come back next week. But read ahead. That's totally cool. Let's, uh, let's lift all this up to God and, and see where this will go.